Okay, boys and girls, welcome back. Um, so today we are looking at an MS9-29S-E. I don't know the full specifics and ramifications of what that actually is, other than the fact this is an MS929 for a 29-inch tube, the Toshiba tube, very similar to the MS8 video I did a week or so ago. Um, link in the description to that one. If you haven't seen it, go back, have a quick look at the MS8 video. This is a follow-on with what I've learned from doing that chassis and being successful on that. This one actually worked. Um, I haven't turned it on in a little while, but this one worked. This came complete straight out of my House of the Dead upright UK-based cabinet. I'll put a little picture pop up here um, just so you can see for reference what that looks like. When I pulled it out, um, so there's a few issues with this monitor. There's a bit of a degaulding issue, which could be a shielding issue in the cabinet itself. Um, the guns don't register all the time because the tube has got a bit of burn in, so I'm probably going to switch the tube for a better one. Um, and I just want to do general maintenance on all my monitors. So the, um, the actual cage is off for electroplating at the moment. It's going for clear zinc plate. Again, I'll just pop a quick picture up now of what that looks like on a pallet, ready to go. I'm quite excited to see the outcome of that. Uh, but in the meantime, let's have a look at it clearing up the chassis, having a quick look at it. I've got the neck board uh, here, and we'll have a quick closer look at that in a moment. Um, but first of all, let's have a quick look at this chassis. I've pulled it off the tube. This is exactly how I pulled it out of the cage in the tube. Immediately, I did have a very quick look at it sideways before I got the camera out. These are Nitticon caps. Uh, not all of them. That filter cap looks original. Um, but a lot of these caps look really good. And I think... I'm wondering if this has already been recapped. I know it came from a private collection. The machine did look very well maintained. So I'm going to guess that this has already had a service kit done on it. So it may not need the work, but for argument's sake, it's not hugely expensive. And I want to compare the um, chassis. So we'll do a cap kit on it, look for dry joints, go from there really. So just having a quick look at it. This is the chassis. Looks slightly different to the MS8. We've got um, the header pins for the deflection coil. It's not one full four pinned connector. It's half there and it's half there. So that's slightly different. Um, we've got the same video connector. We've got a different array of pots now, slightly different flyback. Um, this is meant to be the safer of the two chassis. Um, and that's because more stuff went onto the secondary side rather than the primary side. So the dangerous side. So it's easier. You can scope uh, put a oscilloscope on this to test things if you so wish and it should be a lot safer than what you would have on the MS8. So anyway, that's the chassis. Let's have a quick look at the netboard. Um, yeah, there's a difference with this. You've got these um, sort of little spark gap glass tube um, efforts here. I might see if I can get some uh, closer footage of that at some point. The, the neck adapter is obviously the same. It's very similar. You've got the three big... Uh, resistors and you've got the three transistors. We can see it's quite dusty, um, probably do a clean again, but the chassis does look quite clean. Nice to see we've got the rear protector intact, so that's quite nice. Um, like I say, this does look very clean. I'll just have a quick little scout at it. Um, I think the interesting thing is, is there are some examples, like there's a capacitor point there that's actually left empty on mine. So that must be a variation of the MS9s for some reason. I don't know if there's any other examples of that. Um, we can see there's a, a coil that maybe would have sat there that's missing. Um, things like a resistor there, there's some diodes. So obviously there's variations of this chassis. And I've got another... MS9 to do as well. So it'd be interesting to see how that compares, which is why I want to audit this one properly. Um, if we have a little look, we've got the Nanyo main PCB number here, and on this particular one, it's 05A00675C2. 
and uh, yeah, like I say, I think most of these are Nichicon caps. Um, I'm wondering if anything is actually original other than the filter cap. I don't don't think so. Um, we'll just have a quick look. What's the flyback on this one? It's an MSU one F Foxtrot Hotel Hotel zero nine nine seven three zero seven T. I made a mistake on the MSA. I actually went to clean that label and um, ruined it. So I, I don't know exactly what was on it, but I can probably look that up. So it's a very similar affair. We've got it screwed down. There are some screws in the middle. Um, yep, they're pretty much in the same place. Let's have a quick look at the underside. I bet this plate is almost the same. Yeah, the plate looks very close to um, to the MS8 plate. A lot of flux residue um, on the base. The yeah hasn't been cleaned up as much as I would have expected or hoped. This is obviously a cap. Let me just check. Is that the original or is that? Oh, okay, that's the original. Um, so that's the filter cap there. So I might let them off on that. Um, yeah, if we have a look at the solder joints, they haven't cut the legs that tight. Hmm. We'll um, we'll get it out. And we'll have a look at it in more detail. What I might do before I do that is I might do what I did last time and just get the neck board off. Uh, just so that we're not damaging or fatiguing any of these cables. Um, just for reference, as we look at the neck board, it's very similar to the M8, um, MS8 affair, that the focus wire, the G2 wire, and that particular removable header wire is double cable tied. They're cable side into the strain relief and into the back there. And then equally so this one here is a cable tie for strain relief there. Just for reference. Okay, so that's the cable tie snipped, the wires uh, removed that could be removed and obviously we've got to desolder these two wires here but we'll just have a quick look at the back see what we think where's that capacitor there it is at the bottom there yeah a bit of flux residue but doesn't look the worst I've seen um, obviously flux on the resistor points there so we'll again give it a bit of a cleaning a bit of a reflow possibly reflow these pins but to why it doesn't look hugely bad, we'll get it with the, under the scope a little bit later on. So I've got the um, soldering iron and desoldering station on, and uh, we've got the G2 wire here, so I'm just going to add um, a little bit more solder to the joint if I can. We will see, I might not have put enough temperature on. Yeah, that looks fine. Lovely. Um, so we will just have a quick go at desoldering that one um, yep so that's come out perfectly fine my gun is instantly jammed unfortunately that is a, a bit of a problem with these guns um, you have to remember to keep them clean so you can see there it's not going all the way in so I'll just there you go so I've just knocked the solder joint off inside clean again so it's just something to bear in mind with those um, so that G2 cable is coming out perfectly fine um, the pad is looking nice so I'm happy with that um, so it's just the focus wire to go now are they label stuck together mm. yes they both go through a high voltage label okay um, so the focus wire is going to be similar to the MS8, similar awkwardness. Um, you've got two sort of plastic tabs on each side that you just need to flick open. So that's probably flicked open there. That's probably flicked open there and then you just want to try and open. Might be easier if I just... Yeah, there we go. And that's that open look and it actuates backwards 
um, you've got your focus wire here, soldered to the pin. Um, I just maybe put a little bit of liquid flux on that, and we will try and desolder that out. Don't know if I'll be able to get this on camera easily, but we will try. Am I in frame? Yes, I am. There we go. Okay. Um, that was a bit more awkward than I would have liked, but the pin, of course, that will be hot, but the pin is okay. And um, we'll clean that up, ready for reassembly later. So bringing you down for a bit of a closer look at the neck board here and um, we'll just have a quick go at whacking a bit of alcohol around just to see how easy it is to get some of this soot off. So we can see that's quite a lot of um, dirt that was on there. And I'll just use the cotton bud to just mop it up. And that looks a bit better. I'll just have a look in there. And I think that will be fine for now because we'll um, remove that capacitor and do some bits on here. So, um, like I say, let's have a closer look at the back of the board, see what we think. And we can see that obviously that capacitor was replaced and they didn't really clean up the flux on that. Um, Looks like something there was potentially replaced. Actually, the the, um, the joint on the transistor there doesn't look too special. Um, in fact, yeah, that that one's been reflowed. As has that one. And so that one, it just looks a bit odd from the top. It's a shame I don't have my, um, I've ordered a extendable arm for the microscope to make it easier to, um, to, to give close up shots of this, but I'll, uh, I'll just rub some of the dirt off the top and we'll come back. Okay, so I'm pretty happy that that's a lot cleaner than it was. Um, now in a position where I can probably take some nice pictures of that in my light box because um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to actually um, update the Wikipedia page for all of these monitors and um, make sure that there's some nice archiving footage, archiving pictures so I will um, momentarily take that and uh, I'll just clean up the back of the board as well for that first shot. So let me just do a bit of cleaning on the back. There we go. I think that's um, that's looking really nice and clean, um, a lot better than it was. So what I will do is I will grab those pictures now before we desolder the uh, capacitor, and I will desolder the resistors and the transistors just to um, 
add some fresh solder to those pads. So back with you in a moment. Okay, I lied. <laughs> I think I will um, skip out on that because I have to move on my tripod and stuff. So I'll show pictures once it's done. Um, but what we'll do is we'll just bring up the scope here, um, which again isn't perfect, but it will do for now. And we'll just have a quick look. And um, what have we got? We have got that transistor joint. And I'll just see if I can tweak the focus a little bit. Yeah, it's not looking too bad. I mean, I'll, I'll remove it. In, fa in fact, actually, hmm, the let me get something to point with the far left one. Notice how the sole is sort of not really fully melting onto the pad. So I wonder if that joint is maybe not as perfect as it could be. Of course, it did work. So you know, um, slight ringing. You can just see the ring on that diode. So that joint is cracking. Um, and then what have we got also on this side? We've got the connector. Let's have a little look at the connector pins. They don't look too bad. Um, obviously they'll get reflowed, but I, I don't think they're a problem, or they, they were a problem, if that makes sense. Um, this joint here, I will probably reflow that one. Possibly a little bit of um, solder there, yes. That diode joint I'll probably reflow. That's the one we're obviously just looking at. I'll come around and have a look at this one. The um, joints on that diode look a little bit thin. That one will get more solder. I'm just trying to see where this. Um... Oh, here we go. Thin, a little bit thin solder there. A little bit of a sort of ring crack there, but nothing major. Um, that one will probably get reflowed. And where's the, uh, the third one is up the top here. And again, not the worst. Obviously somebody has um, done maintenance on this in the past. And we'll just check this header down here. Doesn't look like that's been reflowed, so I will definitely be reflowing that. Try and adjust that a little bit. Yeah, that will all get reflowed. Um, having a look at the neck pins. Not bad. Not bad at all, actually. I know that's out of focus quite a bit. I'm sorry about that. Let's see if we can dial that. Um, yeah, I think. That all looks good. We'll just give it a quick um, quick dab with some fresh solder and be on our way. So, um, yeah, let me um, hit this with the desoldering gun to um, just remove a bit of that solder, clean up some of those bits, and get some fresh solder on there. Okay, so 
we've, um, as you've seen there, just removed a lot of solder from that, and I will clean that up in a moment. The resistors obviously fell out, which is fine. Um, they're all the same, and we've got footage of where they went, and of course they're not directional. Uh, and these are all saying they are 5.6 kiloohms on all three. So we'll bring in the multimeter, and um, it's just on a meter. This is an auto ranging meter. And uh, we'll just see what we get. So we will go um, pin to pin, 5.6K. Pin to pin, 5.6K. Pin to pin, 5.6K. So we know that all of our big resistors are fine. Um, what we would do before we fit them is I would just use, I mean, obviously this one was quite clean, um, but you would just use perhaps a, a fiberglass pen. Um, this is a cheap one, you can get better ones, but just a fiberglass pen just to clean up the, um, the actual component leg that's going to be resoldered. Just get any potential corrosion that might be on that pin off. And we'll do the same with the other one. And this is um, not really required for this particular component, but for other ones it may be. Um, but I'm just, for example, showing you here. And I'll do that with the other two. The fiberglass stuff, you don't want to get that in your skin, so have a wet wipe to wipe all that up. And um, back with you in a second. Okay, and I'm looking back at the uh, pads here, we can see that it's a good job they did fall out. There's a little bit of dirt. Um, on the board here which I can just clean off and if we look at the pads underneath again they look really good um, but we'll just do the, the standard a bit of quick go with fiberglass um, it's just to get rid of any oxidization that's on the pad so that when it comes to resoldering um, hopefully it will adhere really well like I say I don't think this board needed it at all um, but I'm just showing you on the off chance that yours might. Um, once you're happy, just go over the board with some alcohol. You can just see me do here. Uh, I think it was Adrian's Digital Basement that I saw this on. Um, he did it with a bit of kitchen towel, I think, but I quite like doing it with this wet wipe as well. Is you just um, place the wet wipe over and just brush through it. And then what you'll see if it is if there was any um, flux residue on the board, um, it sort of mops it up, which is quite nice. And you'll see here when we take this off, probably see it anyway there's sort of some yellowy uh, yellowy tinges and that would have been uh, flux that was sat on the board so that's all off you can see that the board looks nice and clean um, really happy with those resistor points now um, and uh, we need to obviously clean this side as well uh, I haven't removed that capacitor yet but I will do And again, you can see a bit, bit of dirt there. It's not as dirty as it, of course, would have been. And this is by no means a bad board. Um, but we're just mopping away some of the dirt. So this capacitor then, I think it's C332, I think. Um, that's what it seems to be suggesting. So we'll just try and pull that one out now. It's negatively down. Yep, see the little plus sign there. I think if we're lucky. Yep, just 
pull straight out. Um, we'll have a closer look at this in a second. So again, there's obviously some dirt and soot build up, so we'll just, um, with that cap out, it's going to give us a lot better access to this little corner of the board as well, which is really helpful um, because the side of that socket was quite dirty as well. And um, what I sometimes like to do is if I'm struggling to get into corners, is you can just use one of these wet wipes with a cotton bud and you can just use the cotton bud to just sort of poke it in and use that to um, move the wet wipe around, get the dirt out. And you can see, just look at the dirt that I've caught there, just doing that that one time. Of course, you could try and fold it and um, rub it down the side of the socket as well. There's lots of different options you can use to um, try and get the dirt out, try and get these boards nice and clean. So anyway, that's the board a lot cleaner than it was. Let's have a quick look at this cap. Um, obviously I'm glad it's a 105 degree cap, but it's Antel A. Uh, well, probably it's just Antel, isn't it? It would have repeated. Um, 50 volts, 10 microfarads. No idea of tolerance. Doesn't say a tolerance on it. It's not a brand I'm familiar with. I'll have a look in post and see what we think about this, but the uh, yeah, it wouldn't be a cap I would I would want to put on my board. Um, there you go, so pins one and two on the little tester here, just testing the cap. And it's saying it's, yeah, 9,000 nanofarads, which is just shy of the 10, isn't it? It was 10, I believe. My memory's terrible. Uh, yeah, so it's 10 microfarads, which is, you know, 10,000 nanofarads. So that's fine, VLOS 0.8 ESR, 3.1 ohms, hmm. Maybe a bit high on the ESR, but generally a good cap, but obviously I'll replace it. I've shown it in other videos as well. When building up, this is just a cheap set of Lidl's um, digital calipers. Um, you just slam them shut, zero it. Obviously it's not perfect because they're cheap, um, but you just say, hey, what's the diameter? Okay, it's a 10 mil diameter and it is a 17 mil height and a leg spacing of approximately 5 mil on that I would have said if I just squeeze it yeah 5 mil spacing on the legs and we'll build up a spreadsheet and go from there with that one. Just before we get back into resoldering up some of these bits and pieces now um, obviously you saw me desolder the transistors for the red green blue and um, we'll bring the multimeter in. And I don't know offhand what the specific voltage drops should be, but as long as we see them and we don't see it in the other direction, they should be fine. So we'll turn the multimeter to uh, diode mode there. You can see it's on diode mode. And we'll just go on the leg to leg on, on these transistors. So we will try and go that way. Okay, nothing, nothing, nothing. We'll go back the other way. There we go. 0.623. That sounds about right. 0.6. Yeah. So see how you get that. So I would suggest that one's fine. Then where's the other one? Here we go. Six two five, six zero seven. Might be the wrong way round. Sixty one, six zero four. Again, if we turn it round, should get nothing. I know I didn't check that one properly. Yeah, 
Okay, so we can see, and of course you can always do um, a continuity check to check for dead shorts. No dead shorts. No dead shorts. No dead shorts. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, they're all good. And um, we'll just clean this up, put this back together. And that's the netboard done, short of obviously fitting the new capacitor. There we go, I think I've um, covered everything I wanted to cover there on the resolder for now. Um, there's a few joints I need to go over and double check, which I'll do on the scope, but um, hopefully you can see I'll just I'll go all clean what I've done. Just to get rid of the flux that's on there. Let's just go quickly over the board. Then we'll do the wet wipe or you know, whatever you want to call it, kitchen towel trick. And I think that looks like a really clean board. Obviously I've um, completely neglected to uh, solder in the transistors which is uh, pretty important. <laughs> so I'll, um, I'll probably do that off camera in a second. And, um, just look for dry joints, sort those out, and that will be done. So I'm finished with the neck board for today, and I've put that to one side. Obviously we've documented the capacitor that was on it, reflowed anything that looked a bit iffy, um, so I'm now looking at the remote board, and I'm very fortunate that this one's actually in good condition. I've got another one that's in pretty poor condition, and uh, two of the pots have smashed, and the other ones don't really want to adjust, uh, adjust properly. There is a capacitor on these um, remote boards at the end, which we will document. Um, but there's different potentiometers on this one. I think some of them are... These are 332s, which I forget, I think it stands for 3.3 ohms or something, I'll put it on the screen. Um, some of these are 10K, 5K, whatever. And of course, there could be variations. So what I'm going to do is, it's a bit awkward, it's a bit close, but I'm going to bring it under the scope now, um, just so we can see. And um, you can see here that the first pot, VR283, lots of surface rust on the cover, which isn't unusual, it's an old pot. Again, I'm very lucky that these are adjusting um, perfectly fine. Uh, a bit notchy, actually, that one, but it is adjusting. Um, and then these 332s, free free I, I think I'll keep them as spares because they do seem to be in pretty good condition. So that's 280, 281, 282, 284. We don't have the switch on this for the sharpness, thank God. Apparently it's terrible. I've tried it on the MS-8, it looks pointless. Um, 285 there again. The surface rust uh, 286. 289 is a blank spot on both of my um, 
remote boards. 287, sorry I'm battling with a plane outside if you can hear that. Uh, 287, surface rust on the cover. 288, and then the little capacitor. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to actually go through and desolder all of these um, quickly and remove the 332s because I'll just replace them with new ones that I've got coming in the post. And I want to document what these are on, on the two different revision boards. Um, it's the part number there that's different. I think the other one's C1. I just want to see if there's any differences. On the back of the board, there are some differences. Some pot, um, some traces are in a slightly different position, but the front of the board looks pretty identical. And we can see here that the connector, actually the connector pins look to be in pretty good condition. Um, not seeing any cracking in that, but of course we will do all the reflow work on that, deflux it, clean it. Um, and then if we look at some of the pots, let's just go from the edge here. Um, three pins on the front look good. That all looks good. Looks pretty good. Yeah, so I think obviously, like I say, this monitor was working and this um, particular remote board is in better condition than my other one. So I think, um, yeah, it's not unexpected to have not seen any sort of uh, cracking or ringing on these joints. So let's get this off, clean this up, ready for replacements and auditing purposes. Okay, so that's all the legs removed, or desoldered, sorry. So I'm hoping that these um, smaller ones will just pop out with a bit of leg maneuvering. And uh, the bigger ones, I'm having real problems with the sort of grinding legs on it. So uh, I'll use a bit of braid for that. But what we'll do, we'll just bring the scope in now, if I can. So we can see the legs are desoldered. Uh, oh, there might be a little bit of solder on that one. But generally speaking, they are desoldered. Um, it's just the the actual main legs. Let me just spin it around and start with the first one. You can see here I managed to get some of the solder out, but these are still very much um, soldered in, whereas the legs it's nice and loose. Yep, the legs are loose. Um, so you can get this. This is very cheap. This was from Maplin's back in the day. Um, hang on. You can get this uh, desoldering wire. And uh, that with a um, soldering iron should hopefully get that solder off. So we'll just have a go with um, the flux pen. Get the area nice and covered in flux. It's a bit tricky to try and do this with all the different, um, what's it called? And all the different cameras in the way. But we'll, uh, we'll give this a go. So a um, bit of desoldering braid here. I'm going to try and not burn myself. It's very hard to um, hold, desolder, braid, all of that jazz. Um,
Okay, so that's the four uh, small 332 potentiometers out now. And, um, you can see the back looks a little bit, um, I wouldn't say damaged as such, but just a little bit scratched. Um, so what we can do is we can just come in with a little bit of alcohol to clean that up. And we'll just do both sides whilst we're there. Just to get rid of that dirt. And then if we're not happy with any of these pads, we can just bring our old friend in, the fiberglass pen. Um, let me just dab up some of that alcohol. Will evaporate, of course, but trying to keep things moving here. So we'll just clean over that. And again, we'll just go over that area with some more alcohol. And we can just see now, um, I think these pads look perfectly fine, perfectly serviceable, and uh, they'll be ready for the new potentiometers. So I still need to work out how I'm going to get this out. And I think because those obviously three legs are loose, it's just going to come down to probably snipping these legs as close as I can and then pulling it with the iron at the same time. So here we have the naked um, remote board now. All of the pots have been removed. I've um, made some squiggles. So uh, yeah, there we go, squiggles. And um, I'll add that to my spreadsheet and we'll show all that properly in a, in a little bit. Obviously it's still fully populated on the back there. Um, this is quite complex really. Lots of different bits and pieces going on, weirdly compared to the MS-8. Um, but yep, it's all desoldered and what we'll do is obviously I'll reflow the connector at some point when I solder that lock back in. So that's the remote board done and the neck board done for as far as we can really take it today. Um, the next issue will be having a look at the chassis. So what we'll do is I'll move the camera up a little bit and we'll just have a quick look at that. So this is looking at the chassis from the overhead perspective now. And very similarly to the MS-8, because I think it is the same base plate. We've got the one, two, three, four, five, six, down in there, screws to take out. So we will do that. So that's all the screws removed. And what I'm actually going to do is just at the back here, we've got this little... Um, grinding lead to a lug and I'm just gonna pull that one off as well and uh, yeah we'll see if we can get this out shall we there we go that's it removed so I've now got the opportunity to have a quick look at the underside properly, which we can do. And um, yeah, as discussed previously, quite a lot of um, sort of fluxy uh, joints there. And God, does the solder joints on that um, transformer actually look very, very dry and tired. Um, that filter cap as well, yeah, really not happy with these joints. Looks like they never reflowed the pin headers there. Or there. Or there. So, uh, yeah, all the standard work to be done. Um, watch this space. Okay then, guys. So, um... I've shown uh, quite a lot, I'm sure, already. I've had the potentiometers delivered uh, yesterday for the remote board, the 332s. I've found the correct replacements for these now. 
So they will get ordered, but they won't be here for a week or so. Um, you can see they're not quite in alignment. Um, the legs, sadly, are slightly different pitch or you need to bend them in a slightly different way. Um, so I ended up sort of just having to freehand it, but it's for my personal machines. They're, they're relatively in line, nice and secure. You know, they're not going anywhere. So I'm happy with that. They're soldered and I've done the connector as well. So that's all clean, ready to go. I'm just waiting for the new um, 5K and 10K pots. The chassis, chassis, whatever you want to call it. I'm past the point of caring on that much. Um, as said previously, it has been recapped. The filter cap is original. Um, I was a bit disappointed to see that they haven't reflowed the connector pins and this pin, for example, on the flyback looks really dull, um, like really, really dull. And I imagine it's because um, probably a bit of damp damage and that sort of stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna whiz through, try and remove all the capacitors. I'll have to document them at the same time, which is gonna be a bit tedious. Um, so I might try and put you on a time lapse. We will see. Um, we'll go from there, really. Okay guys, so what I've had to do is actually stop the video there. Um, it would just take far too long and be far too boring uh, to show me desoldering all of the capacitors, measuring them with the digital calipers, trying to write it on a spreadsheet, all of that jazz. I'm very well aware how boring my voice is and how long my videos are and how tedious they must be to watch. I struggle myself. It's a very dry topic, it's not exactly humorous. So I apologize for that. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into the spreadsheet. This is obviously after the fact now. And you can see down the left-hand side, we've got all of the locations across the relevant boards. We've then got the values, the voltages, the sizes, the readings of my actual capacitors, and uh, if I think they are or are not in spec. Now, interestingly, I'm glad I did decide to remove all of the capacitors because I found some very interesting things. This Antel cap is just a cheap Chinese sort of replacement. And over, apparently they are good caps. If it's genuine, is it? Who knows? It was out of tolerance, whichever way you look at it. Uh, then we had this one. Now I'll bring a picture up on screen in a second of this uh, Ni Ni Nihon Kon. <laughs> I don't know. However, you would pronounce that. But obviously, it's designed to look like Nichicon, and it isn't. So, ironically, that one was in spec. It seems, um, but it's fake. It's not a real capacitor. It's not a Chinese fake. The gold blue caps are probably Panasonic. Uh, this cap again, it's not known as a reputable brand. Chong X, Chang X, it, it depends. It's not very clear from the text what, what it actually was, but either way, they're all Chinese clones, Chinese ripoffs. So actually, it turns out the Nichicon caps were original, the Nippon caps are original, and then this hodgepodge of just crap. Um, is what somebody's put in. So it definitely needed a full recap, 100%, you know, without a doubt. So what I've done is I've cleared this up a little bit and I will put this on the wiki page. And this is what I believe would have come from factory. This is comparing exactly what was on my board and then looking at MS9 service manuals to try and fill in the gaps. I don't know who makes UPL caps. 
um, sort of had to leave that blank. But other than that, to the best of my knowledge, this is what we were looking at. This is what it would have come with. And you can see I've also got a list of uh, replacements here. This is what I've picked and ordered from Mauser. If you're interested in knowing how to do a capacitor kit, I've shown it in other videos. Um, basically, go to Mauser, use their search filters, and search through uh, for the various different values, and you'll truncate down and eventually come up with a couple of options and then pick whichever one suits you best. Um, as I say, I'll be putting this on the wiki page. And because of this, I've now been able to successfully order all of the capacitors. And this costs around about £25 plus the VAT. And it's free shipping because I always make a large order. I think the last order was about £80. Odd pounds. Uh, and then finally, just whilst we're here, we'll have a look at the uh, pots that have been discussed for the remote board. And you can see that we've got one of the 5K pots and one, two, three, four of the 10K pots. Again, we've got replacements. Now, interestingly, looking at the data sheet for these potential replacement pots, unfortunately, we won't know what was so interesting about that. Um, when I did that recording, my Mac ran out of space temporarily, so the recording abruptly ended. Um, most of the recording for this was done in August and September. For various different reasons, I had to pause, walk away. Um, so it's now been Christmas. It's, what are we on now? We're on the 28th of December. So it's been a couple of months. I'm trying to catch up and work out where I left off and get this video wrapped up. So just bear with me, thanks. In the previous spreadsheet about the potentiometers, you saw the 3.3K pots and they were only available on Amazon. They are really awkward to try and find in that value in that form factor. Um, in the links will be two links to two Amazon articles and one is for a like a mixed 150 pieces pack where there's a couple of them which is enough to get you going or there's also a big bag of a hundred of the 3.3k pots and don't let the pictures confuse you in actual fact when I've ordered both and when the big bag arrived it was the exact same pot the blue with the white dial uh, that is in the mix pack here we are then, so this is the big bag of stuff from Mauser now, this is all the caps, this is the uh, potentiometers, the other ones that you can order uh, for the adjustment board and some various different bits and bobs that you might be able to pick out in the picture. Um, so yeah, we will move forward. Now I showed it earlier in the video with the uh, 332 3.3k uh, pots on the remote board. Uh, but this is just a quick picture to show the completely refurbished board compared to an original, which I've got. And you can see on this original, the first couple of pots there are absolutely decimated. They've snapped, they've cracked, they, they'd be unusable. Um, so you can see that it's well worth doing, and hopefully this will give this monitor probably good use for the rest of its life now. Um, unfortunately, Alps... Uh, you cannot seemingly get the original pots. You can get the original values um, on Mauser, but not the original design with the cross for a screwdriver to go in. So the best I could get was the, the four pots on the left. You can see they're actually flat topped with the gnarled edging. Uh, and I think what I would probably do is, if I needed to, is just cut a slot across it so that you could use a flat head to adjust them. And unfortunately, I couldn't get that style with a flat top for the furthest left uh, potentiometer. So it's the kind of cut off style that would have a knob screwed down onto it. Um, so I don't, I don't know how easy it would be to cut a slot in that without having it fall apart. But um, yeah, it's just something to, to make you aware of. Earlier on in the video, I mentioned that the cages and the surrounds, the, the actual monitor housing, uh, had been sent off for chemical dip and electroplating. And I'm pleased to say they came back. I was not too impressed with the price, to be quite honest. I think I was told something like 40, 50 pounds a monitor, which I was like, yeah, great, you know. So all in, 80 quid, maybe 100 pounds for two monitors. And I think it had come back at about 130, 140 in the end. Um, and the Google reviews for the place had said as much that 
they'll tell you one price in person and when you're going to pick it up it'll be something else so yeah I'm not sure how I feel about that but in principle the job they've done is fantastic it's all come back um, absolutely gleaming the the guy on the phone said oh we're, we're just a bit concerned some of them had a lot of rust on it so there might be some pitting in the final finish and I said well I don't care about that you're never going to see it what I care about is that it's clean it's rust free it's protected it's plated that this is going to last another 20 30 years whatever it takes the, the monitors you know um, probably don't have that in it so yeah, I, I was happy with what came out. And you can see here on screen, this is a MS9 and an MS8. And um, we'll come in for a closer look at the bolts as well, because I've got those done. Looking at the um, the bolts, nuts, washers, etc. Uh, it all came out absolutely fantastic. I'm, I am really pleased that I went through the effort of getting this done. Here you can see the MS9 uh, plate for the chassis to sit on and um, the astute among you in the reassembly pictures in a moment will notice that I actually reassembled it with an MS8 plate at first which was incorrect and had to flip them and how you can tell the difference is where the video connector is in the bottom right hand corner there's a couple of additional holes and there's two little screw holes on top which is for the uh, additional VGA socket for the 31 kilohertz uh, versions of the MS9s. Here we have the uh, new cage being assembled now over my best MS9 tube, which are the Toshiba tubes. And um, as I explained earlier, this monitor will be for my House of the Dead machine, so it's got to be the best of the best because of the light guns and the way they work and such. Uh, so this tube, I cleaned it all down as best as I could, dusted it down where I could, um, removed any soot that I could uh, with a microfiber and some cheap furniture polish. Um, when I went through my grand stuff, I found an old tin of Wilco's uh, furniture polish and it's surprisingly good at getting rid of soot with a, um, with a microfiber without being too abrasive or damaging or anything like that. So that was good. So I went all over the tube, started reassembling the cage and you can see here it's, uh, it's being reassembled. Don't worry, there is something under the tube face. And I was very careful when I put it down that hopefully no um, dust particles internally have been dislodged or anything like that. It was only for a, a short amount of time. This is looking at it now up on its back and you can see it's all looking nice and tidy. You've got the Deagle's circuit there um, all looking nice and clean. And this is a closer look at the uh, back plate where the chassis would go. And uh, again, I'm, I'm pleased with how it's all looking. Here we have the side to side of the before and after pictures of the chassis. I'm sorry that the split screen is cut it not really that great, but I'll, I'll flick out to the full picture momentarily. Um, we can see the difference isn't as noticeable as on my MS8 video because this chassis was quite clean to start with. Um, but you can clearly see that on the left, of course, some of the original capacitors are there, like the big filter cap in the bottom right, um, and then the sort of odd hodgepodge of brands in the middle, which some might be Panasonic, some might be something else. Um, but we can see on the right that that's all new capacitors now. Some of the electrolytics have been replaced with um, red type of caps the the wimmer w-i-m-a i'm not sure what style of cap they are whether they're film or, or what have you but anyway uh you can see that all the new caps are in the picture on the right and it's looking nice and clean switching to the underside of the board you can see uh, again the split screen hasn't isn't doing this justice so we'll we'll switch this out momentarily but you can see a big difference. On the left, you can see that there was a lot of burnt on flux uh, from factory. There was a lot of dull uh, solder joints that really looks like they needed refreshing. But you can see on the right, there is no burnt on flux. It's all nice and clean. Uh, you can see that the pin headers have been reflowed. The flyback has, of course, been reflowed multiple times. Um, and actually, I'll get into that because we haven't covered that bit in the video yet. But it's looking really nice, really clean. Um, so we're ready 
to finish reassembling the monitor and give it the first power on try. Here we are then, we've got the monitor fully assembled now, it's back on the table. Uh, you can see you've got the remote board connected there, the nice new reconditioned remote board. We've got the um, test pattern generator, which I imported from America. I've got the multimeter set up to do B+, you'll see that connected in a future picture in a second there. And you can see you've got the power cable. I've, I've just sort of done a pigtail into the um, output of the chassis, um, which goes into a 110 converter because I'm obviously in the UK. And uh, as we look around here, you can see again from the back, um, everything's all connected up now. And when we get into the uh, close-up of the chassis there, you can see the crocodile clip onto the ground. That's to test the B plus output. And I made up a little wire, um, which you can't quite see, but it, it goes to a test point for that B plus. And finally here it is looking at from the flyback side. And then just looking at it as a overhead view. Okay, so I've had to skip a lot of stuff because um, it was just dragging on way too long. I didn't want to film soldering in 40 odd caps. So the chassis is now recapped. All of the caps are replaced. Um, this is not the final tube I want to connect it to. It's not even the original tube. This is my spare MS9 tube, which actually isn't too bad. It's got a little bit of screen burning, but it's not too bad. Um, so I thought rather than blow up my perfect tube, because obviously I trust my work uh, relentlessly, um, I thought I'll try it on this one and we'll see how we go. So the, the chassis is all rigged up with the pigtail that I used for my MSA and testing my MS9s as well. Um, I've got the test pattern generator set up. It's going to be on standard res. Because uh, it's an MS9, it doesn't need an isolation transformer, just a step down transformer. I've looked up that test point two on the board is the B plus point. So I've got the multimeter on voltage connected to the B plus in the ground. Unlike the M8, you don't need to worry about the ground on this because it's all isolated or something like that. So you can just ground it to the um, heat sink fine. Whereas on an MS8, you can't do that. I've got the remote board connected up, got a screwdriver. I've got the flyback turned down um, we've got neck, we've got DAG ground, got the anode cup plugged in. I think, I think I'm as ready as I'll ever be to test this. Um, I always doubt myself, but fingers crossed this goes right and not bang. So what I'll do is I'll just crouch down, You'll probably see me here, apologies for that. Um, I'm going to plug it into the step down transformer. And, um, I'll turn on the test pattern generator, that would help. And yeah, let's give it a go and hope for the best, I guess. Okay, well, we get a picture, I do get some horrible noises. Seeing noise. Not ideal, is it? So I suppose, let me have a look. Hmm. Where is that noise coming from? And also, my B plus, my multimeter isn't. Maybe I haven't set it to the right um, setting. I thought that was on volts. Okay, so we're apparently looking for 76 volts on the um, B plus. And we're getting 75.1, so a little bit low. Is that enough to make that annoying noise? I don't know. Um, I'm trying to remember what these do now. I 
Okay, well, all of the pots work nicely now. That looks pretty damn good. Like I say, the B plus is a tiny bit low. Um, and I need a flat head to adjust that. Got the world's uh, most elaborate screwdriver here for the job. So just before we move forward with the video, I just wanted to show a couple of pictures, a couple of still shots of the different test patterns that the monitor is displaying. Obviously it's not color calibrated. Obviously um, the purity rings are marginally out, convergence is marginally out, that sort of stuff. But remember this is not the final tube. So this is just me showing that generally speaking, it looks quite nice. Okay guys, so I just want to, um, I'll probably cut out a little of the footage I just took there. <laughs> um, so I just want to show you that it's been on for mm, 10 minutes now. It's kind of settled down. Glorious 15 kilohertz wine. There is a weird, what sounds like a shorting spark every now and again. It's not done it now. But we'll go through the different colour patterns. Right, did you see that then? There was a, like a, a spark noise and a tremor there. So we're gonna go for the um, power on in medium res, 24 kilohertz now. So we've got the test pattern generator switched over, I've switched over the lead. Oh, there was that sparking sound again. Of course, I haven't adjusted the colours yet, but you can see, pretty pleased with that generally, really pleased actually. So I'm going to turn this off, I don't want to um, leave it like this, but really pleased. So as you all have just seen, um, there is a sparking noise and I managed to get some footage of it close up. Didn't quite catch the spark in um, that footage. I think I did manage to catch it somewhere else, but I don't know where, that's, uh, where that footage is gone. But basically, I managed to catch it by eye at least. And it looks like it's sparking from the flyback to, you can see in this picture here, there's a resistor and a coil just behind the flyback. And I believe it's hitting that. So let me change to a better picture. So here you can see the uh, resistor and the coil behind the flyback with the flyback removed. And um, there's a few things on this picture that are sort of of interest really. One, the coating on the resistor is peeling. Um, so either the resistor has got very hot or something has been sparking against it and burning off that um, coating. So that's one thing to note. The coating on the coil is obviously so old and has got so hot that it's deteriorated. It's started to flake off, so you can see the bare copper within the coil. But if you look at the two metal brackets that hold the, I think it's the HOT on the other side of that heatsink, you can see there's two sort of um, markings to the right of the left clip. And I have a funny feeling it was sparking against that as well. Um, so ultimately, I, I did a lot of mucking about here, which I'll, I'll just jump to another picture to show you. 
So you can see here now the coil has been taken out, cleaned and put back, as has the resistor. That's actually a different resistor off of a different MS9 chassis. Um, I wasn't happy with how the coating on it had flaked, and I thought I would just put a little bit of heat shrink on the legs just to avoid it potentially shorting to that or that shorting to anything else. And you can see I've put some heat shrink around the coil to almost replace the coating that was once there. Unfortunately, the heat shrink I had to hand that was big enough for it was way too big for it. So it's quite a thick um, heat shrink. I would have liked to have used a thinner black one to obviously match how it would have been originally. But, you know, I'm, I'm happy. Time will tell whether that will potentially cause a heat issue with it. I don't know. Um, let me know in the comments. Okay, welcome back. Guys, we've got the, the good tube now. This is my best tube, so I hope this bloody works. Uh, so we've got the best tube now. We've got the test pattern generator on. We've got the chassis on. I've um, heat shrinked that coil and I've replaced the resistor with the one from my other spare MS9 for now because uh, I wasn't happy with it. And I've put some heat shrink on the legs as well. So I'm hoping that will stop the sparking, whatever the hell that was. Um, I've checked the flyback. It doesn't look to have any cracks in it, so I, I can't see it's that. So here we are again. Um, let's fire it up and, well, hopefully not, not fire, but uh, let's start it up and see what happens. Nothing. Why am I getting nothing? That's concerning. Let's try that again. Okay, we've got something now. Maybe it was a loose connection. Um, yeah, so we've got a slight sort of pin cushiony issue on the edge, and obviously the colours all need to be tweaked. But damn, is that a stable picture? Um, annoyingly, the camera is not quite in sync with the refresh rate, so I know you're seeing a bar. I'm sorry about that. We're getting 76.1 volts on the B, which it's perfect, it should be 76 volts as far as I remember. Um, obviously there's some quirky linearity issues here. This seems to be big squares, small squares. Um, maybe that can be tweaked with the pots that are on the uh, actual board. Look at that. So we've got Obviously, I know the blacks aren't great, it needs to all be tweaked, but all the different shades of red, all the different shades of green, all the different shades of blue, and you can see, yes, wider, smaller, linearity issues there. Look at that image. Fundamentally, so far, no sparks, no sparking. Um, the chassis sounds lovely and quiet, actually. Um, <laughs> so this is my best tube that I took out of a Daytona, but this will be going in my House of the Dead. This is my House of the Dead MS9 chassis, which I've recapped, reflowed, done all the pots on the neck board, and that's good. Um, this is my original House of the Dead uh, cage, that's all been zinc plated and hopefully you've seen those pictures in the video by now. This is literally all ready to go um, back into the House of the Dead. It, it won't be, I'll be bagging it up and, and keeping it nice and dry and clean, but this is looking really good. I mean, that picture is looking really good. Obviously, convergence marginally. I mean, we'll get to the checkerboard, I suppose. Yeah, so you can see our guns are out of alignment, so the convergence rings need tweaking. You can see the pin cushioning. It's going to be on 24 kilohertz anyway, not 15, so I don't particularly care about what it looks like right now. Um, but this is looking really positive. It's a 
shame that the black level is... Oh, actually, look, you can see raster lines here. So the screen pot is potentially up just, just a tad too much for this particular tube. So I'll, I'll fiddle about with that off camera. Um, I don't know if you can see the raster lines, actually. Maybe, maybe not. But they're, they're very faint. They are there. Um, wow. <laughs> it works. It works, and I'm very happy. Very, very happy with the quality of that. And I can't believe how quiet it is. No sparking, no nothing. So, yeah, I think we'll, we'll cut to a roundup, and I'm, I'm really, really pleased. Okay guys, so you've just seen a little bit of footage there just showing the monitor running with a replacement flyback. Sadly, I had to switch the flyback in from my other MS-9. I don't know what is going on with that flyback. It's obviously sparking in some way. It must be failing, um, which is a great shame because the picture output from it is quite nice. Um, is what it is, unfortunately. So this is the end of the video now, finally. Finally got there. Hey, uh, If you're still here, congratulations. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> Um, what's on the screen now is a Sega Touring Car manual, which I saw on Facebook. It's £40, possibly a bit expensive, I don't know. Um, but I always say that I like to, and I want to, and I will, uh, upload all my findings to the Wikipedia page, all of the capacitor um, values, all of the sizing, all of that sort of good stuff. And I'm also going to do some technical drawings of the, the layout um, for a PCB guide and all that sort of good stuff of where the caps sit. Um, because I, I value the community and I value sharing information with people. Uh, what I did notice is when I was looking, the load, uploaded schematics are very poor quality. They're very old, very old scam. Um, and that also there is no proper manual uh, for the Nanyo MS929, um, or at least not a, a decent one. So I thought, I know Sega used to always include these manuals in the back of their game manuals. I wonder if one is in this manual. So I took a pump, £40, I bought it. Sure enough, the manual is in there. So I'm going to do a separate video showing me uh, scanning, correcting, um, adding OCR so that you can search it for words, making it a, a readable PDF. And I will upload that to the wiki so that other people don't have to spend that money to get that manual. They'll be able to get it for free now. Um, I'm not in these videos for money. I'm in it for the community and helping others and learning along the way. Um, all I ask is if you enjoyed the video, drop me a like, drop me a sub, uh, subscribe. And, um, you know, if you can, be positive. Share information with me if you have something to benefit what I'm doing. Um, share information with others. And hopefully the goodwill can go round. So... With that said, we're a few days away from the new year, so I wish everybody a very happy new year. And hopefully 2024 can be a better year for everybody, wherever they are. So thank you for watching, and we'll talk again.